Okay, welcome to your physics lesson. My name is Mr. Han, and I'm the head of physics at um, Sir Henry Floyd Grammar School. And I'm going to be teaching you today about something called stationary waves, which is the physics that explains how lots of musical instruments work, um, guitars, anything stringed, and also anything with air columns. So the vast majority of musical instruments. Um, I'm going to be here in this little box that you can see, talking for part of this, and I'll disappear for part of it as well. Um, when I need the screen filled with something else. So, I hope you appreciate, by the way, that I'm delivering the lesson from space, which has nothing whatsoever to do with stationary waves, but it just seemed a physics place to deliver the lesson from. Um, so, stationary waves on guitar strings. So, what are we going to learn about today? Well, we're going to learn about ideas that build on some of the things that you did at GCSE to do with transverse longitudinal waves and things like that. And we're going to start with this little question um, about the GCSE ideas that you may have covered. So we've got there six waves. Uh, what I want you to do, and you can pause the video when I ask these questions, by the way, to give yourself time, yourself time to think um, so that you can come up with an answer rather than let me tell you the answer straight away. So when I've asked the question, pause it, see what your answer is, and then you can compare it with mine. So the first thing I want you to do is look at these waves then, and I want you to ask, want to ask you which of these waves has the highest frequency. So pause the video, have a look, and make your decision. Okay, the highest frequency wave is wave F. Um, we can tell that because the frequency is the number of waves per second. If we're assuming that this is time along here, then this would be um, the one with the most waves in a given time. In this 10 square block here, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight peaks. The next highest frequency has got one, two, three, four, five peaks within that same block of time. So wave F is the highest frequency. Next question, get ready to pause again. Which of the waves has the biggest amplitude? So pause now and have a think what your answer is. Okay, the biggest amplitude here is wave B. The amplitude we can spot by the height of the wave above the middle line. And if we look at this one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight squares high. The next highest, um, maybe this one or wave E, with one, two, three, four, five, six and a half, and one, two, three, four, five, six and a half. They're both the same. Okay, next question. Which of these has the which will be the quietest sound. So which of these waves will have the quietest sound? Pause the video and see what you think. And the answer to this one is that F, again, is the quietest sound. And the reason it's the quietest sound isn't anything to do with the number of waves here. It's the amplitude that we just talked about a moment ago. This has got the smallest amplitude, and the amplitude of a wave determines its volume. So wave F has the quietest sound as well as the highest frequency. And the final question I want to ask you is I want you to look uh, at the waves and tell me which two of the waves if you heard them, if they were sound waves, which two of these waves would have the same pitch? So pause it and have a think. And the two waves that would have the same pitch are wave B and wave C. And the reason, well, pitch is linked to frequency or wavelength, and these two have the same wavelength. If we look at the wavelength here, we've got one block of 10 and then two extra squares for wave B one block of 10 and two extra squares for wave C. So wave B and C have both got the same wavelength, therefore they would have the same pitch, okay? That's some GCSE revision. I'm just gonna move out of the way for a second. So if you have a look at this list here, now this is a list of things from the um, specification document and it tells you the things that you need to learn about stationary waves. Now there's a lot here and we're not gonna go through everything on here today, but we are gonna talk about quite a bit of this. We're gonna have a look at the basic concept of stationary or standing waves as they're sometimes called. Um, we're gonna focus on stretched strings today, but as I said earlier, it also refers to air columns. We're gonna look at graphical representations of a stationary wave briefly. We'll talk about the similarities and the differences between stationary waves and progressive waves. We'll look at this idea of something called nodes and antinodes, how stationary wave patterns form on a stretched string. We'll also talk about the bottom bit here, which I've just covered up with the um, 
the thing which will hang on one second <laughs> there we go um the bottom of there the fundamental mode of vibration the first harmonic and what harmonics are those are the ideas that we're going to focus on today and we'll touch upon each of them a little bit in a full lesson we'd go into a lot more detail and we'd actually spend a few lessons on these ideas but we're going to have a bit of a, a whistle stop tour going quite quickly First of all, we're going to watch a little video. Now, this video is um, Physics Girl. I don't know if you've seen Physics Girl on YouTube. Well worth watching. Loads of really fantastic videos. So we're just going to watch this video, which covers some great ideas to do with standing waves or stationary waves in a, about four minutes or so. So have a look at this. Hi there. Did you want to create some cool physics art without having to do any of the design yourself? I thought so. We've got the square plate on the mechanical vibrator, which is plugged into the tone generator. This vibrates the plate at different notes as we change the frequency here. I'll sprinkle a little sand on the plate, and now watch this. Why does this happen? As I tune the plate to vibrate at very specific frequencies, or notes, the sand moves on the plate into beautiful, though unusual, patterns. As I find higher and higher special frequencies, the patterns on the plate get more intricate. How awesome is this? But it does kind of sound like a dying ferret. <gasps> Why does it happen? The main concept here is resonant modes. Let's back up a little bit to the physics of waves. In physics, a wave is a disturbance <gasps> traveling through a medium or through space. If I constrain my medium at the other end, the wave reflects back at me. See? Now, if I send continuous waves down the slinky, they also reflect back, and what I get is two waves, one moving away from me and one moving at me. But obviously the rope can't be in both places at once, so as my incoming wave reflects back, I don't see both waves, I see a combination of the two. The waves add when they're on top of each other and subtract when they're opposing one another. And something crazy is happening. You've got a wave going this way combined with a wave moving that way, and when they interfere, the result is, as you might expect, a wave that doesn't appear to be moving in any direction. It's standing! This is called a standing wave. And so is this. The places where the wave appears to be not moving at all are called nodes and the places where they're moving a lot are called anti-nodes. Now that we've mastered standing waves, let's go back to our square plate. If you look closely, there are places where the plate and the sand are moving a lot, and places here where they're not moving at all. These are nodes, just like the nodes that didn't move on our slinky. Here are the anti-nodes. And just like we needed specific frequencies to get standing waves on our slinky, the same is true of our plate. These specific frequencies are called resonant modes, and they're caused by waves traveling out from the center, bouncing off the sides, and interfering with each other just right so we get standing patterns. Also, the higher the frequency, the closer together the nodes, just like the slinky. But now, what if you did this in three dimensions? You could have vibrations coming from the sides and from the front and back, and you'd get interference from all of these such that there'd be nodes in mid-air, places where the air is completely unmoving, and you could, hypothetically, place an object there and cause it to levitate. That would be crazy. But it's exactly what researchers from the University of Tokyo and the Nagoya Institute of Technology did. Really, the physics is the cool part, so stay tuned to see the vibrations on these plates.
I'm back. I wasn't back for a moment. Um, just clicking back a slide. So I hope you'll agree that's really quite cool stuff, especially the levitation of the, the little particles that we're doing, and even a little um, LED floating in, in, in air held by sound waves effectively. Really, really amazing. So just to recap the idea about stationary waves, and I'm just going to shrink myself down a tiny bit so that we can see those words. So stationary waves are these waves that are actually caused by two waves traveling in opposite directions that form interference in such a way that the resulting wave doesn't appear to be moving. Now, there's different ways of producing, and you can see here on this diagram, we could maybe have a fixed end and we get a wave reflecting back on itself. So you can see here the wave reflecting along the bottom. You can also do the same with a free end. And if you keep those waves traveling forwards and meeting the reflected waves, then we get something like this, where the two um, colored lines, the blue and the red line, are showing the two waves traveling in opposite directions. And the resulting pattern that you get on the piece of string that you're using for this is shown by the black line. And you can see the weird effect is that there are certain places, these red dots here, where there is no movement, no displacement. And in fact, remembering that it's no displacement is useful because they're called nodes. Nodes are points of no displacement, okay? So we get these points called nodes um, and we get this wave that seems to be staying in place, just oscillating up and down as opposed, as opposed to moving backwards and forwards. And this is actually what we get on stringed instruments. Now, on a guitar, for example, we have strings that are fixed between two positions. So if we just have a look on here, um, if you imagine these two dots represent the two ends of the guitar where the string is attached. So the waves that we could set up on those strings, if you imagine those oscillations on the string, the standing wave oscillating like that, the waves that we could set up have a constraint on them. And that constraint is that there has to be a fixed point at each end these two bits at either end can't be moving up and down so the type of wave that you fit on there has to be a wave that isn't moving at those points and there are only certain um, particular waves that you can fit and those different waves are called harmonics this one that we're looking at here is called the first harmonic and it's the um, the biggest wavelength wave that you can fit on your guitar string and it's called the fundamental frequency or the first harmonic and all the successive waves that we can fit on a guitar string are multiples of that. So the second one that we could fit looks like this. The second one, the second harmonic, is twice the fundamental frequency. And again, it's got two fixed points, two nodes at either end, but now there would be a node here. Now this would be oscillating up and down, and this would be oscillating up and down, and there'd be a fixed point there, just like on the animation that we saw previously. The next wave that we could fit on there, the third harmonic, would look like this. This one has a node at either end again, just like before, but there'd now be a node here and there'd be a node here. This would be oscillating backwards and forwards, so would this, so would this, but then we'd have nodes at those two points as well as at the end. And that would be three times the fundamental frequency. And then the fourth harmonic would look like this. Now, the key thing here is that there are only these fixed frequencies that you can fit on, these fixed wavelengths, all multiples of that fundamental frequency, the first harmonic. You can't fit on the in-between ones. So it sets up, when you set your guitar up with a certain length of string, you're setting up a limit on the frequencies that it's going to be able to produce. Now, with a guitar, there's all sorts of complications to how the different notes are produced, but there's one thing that a guitarist uses that's actually named after these harmonics. And if you play guitar, you'll know the word that I'm talking about, and it is harmonic. So there is a technique on the guitar where we say we, we've hit a harmonic or we're producing a harmonic, and it's actually based on this bit of physics. So I'm just gonna show you a video that I put together that shows harmonics being played on a guitar, and then we'll talk about how they occur based on this physics. Now I'll demonstrate using this effect, and lots of guitarists use this. The effect is called a harmonic. Now, if I just play a note, say this note here, or four notes there, that's how the notes sound without any harmonic embellishments. And what I'm going to do on that last note, I'm just going to use a technique called a pinched harmonic. I'll show you what it sounds like first of all. So we get that higher pitch. We can get different pitches out of it, actually. The same note, I'm just going to use this finger here, but listen to the different pitches that I can get. So I'm getting those different pitches by something I'm doing with my right hand 
down here on the string. Now, there's other ways of doing it as well. If I just um, hit a note on the string here and then do this, I've changed the pitch. Now, you might not see what I've done there because it's really, really difficult to spot what's happening. So I'll just zoom in a little bit on the end of the guitar. And if we look, when the string is open and playing, I'm resting my finger very gently part way down the string. If I do it in different places, I will get different pitch changes. So listen again. Now, what I'm not doing is I'm not pressing down. If I press down, that will produce a different pitch, but in a, in a different way. So here's me pressing down, and here's me doing what I was doing before. And you can hear they're quite different. Also, when you're pressing down, if you try and do that with the string ringing, it just stops the note pretty much. Whereas if we do the harmonic effect, you can see it will keep on ringing. There's actually loads of positions along the neck where you can do that. If I just move my finger up and down while strumming uh, with my right hand, you can hear, and you can see that I'm not pressing my finger. I'm just resting. So I'm just going to come back in there. Um, there was a slight issue there with some of the audio. I hope that didn't um, spoil it too much. I hope you could hear it. So that's the sound of a harmonic then, that idea of that higher pitch note, that, that strange sort of note that we get in there and those different ways of doing it. Um, the way I was producing it with my right hand, the pinched harmonic, you actually use the, the soft edge of your thumb there to rest slightly on the string after you've plucked it, um, where you, with the, the, the hand that actually strikes the string. So let's just have a look at why this is happening and why we're we getting these notes. So here's our diagram of the different harmonics that we talked about uh, a couple of slides ago. So we've got the first harmonic, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. Each of those um, that we can see there are still fixed between those two nodes at either end. So we've got the fixed point here and the fixed point here, and these are all the harmonics that can be produced. Now, interestingly, on a guitar, when you strike the string, if you just strike an open string on a guitar, all of those harmonics will form on the string at once and you'll actually get a weird combination of all of them forming on the string the one that you hear the most is the one that has the largest amplitude now have a look at the screen there and i think you can see which one has the largest amplitude it's the fundamental frequency so the fundamental frequency the first harmonic has the largest amplitude and therefore the largest volume and so that's the one that you hear um, as the dominant sound so you hear that frequency as the dominant sound but all those other notes are ringing as well and they're all multiples of the first one double the frequency triple quadruple and so on so all of those sound at once on the guitar when you strike the string but if you rest your finger like i demonstrated if you rest it gently about halfway down the string imagine i rest my finger here where this is now i'm not pressing down so i'm not shortening the string that's a different way of changing the note i'm resting my finger gently what it means is that this one can no longer form because if i'm resting my finger here this one needs to be moving it needs to be an anti-node at that point and if it can't move it can't sound so the first harmonic will be removed from the sound of the guitar as will hopefully you can see the third harmonic as will the fifth and the seventh and all those odd numbered ones so one three five and so on will all be missing now that means two things one, we reduce the volume ever so slightly because we're removing the loudest sound component, but also it's going to sound higher pitched because I've taken out those, well, the lowest frequency and then the third lowest frequency and then the fifth lowest frequency and so on. So we get that higher pitched sound. If I was to place my finger a third of the way along the string, so that would be here, then that would actually stop this one and this one from forming. So the third harmonic would form and that would sound like a higher pitch again. And the only other ones that can sound are the ones that have a node at that position where I've gently rested my finger. So we could have the third harmonic sounding, we couldn't have the fourth, we couldn't have the fifth, but we could have the sixth harmonic and that carries on. We could have the ninth and so on. So again, you get this higher pitch. Now, when I was, um, 
just moving my finger up and down the string. What I was doing was effectively selecting all those different harmonics to let them sound or not sound um, by moving my finger. Now, a guitarist might not understand the physics behind um, what's going on there, but they will learn where they need to place their, their finger to produce those kind of sounds, and they can use that to embellish their guitar technique. So just another quick video just to show several strings at once ringing with the harmonics and not the harmonics, just to reinforce what I was just saying. So that's harmonics, and that's the open strings. Harmonics, strings on their own. So I hope you can see there that we get this higher pitch when we have the harmonics, and I'm just resting my finger. It's cancelling out some of the harmonics and letting others ring, and it's losing the lower frequencies, um, certain lower frequencies each time. Okay, so I want you to have a think about um, the ideas that, that you've learned there. Okay, hopefully you've picked up something useful. The physics girl video is, is great. Hopefully that was um, quite quite interesting to see. Um, and if you play guitar or another stringed instrument, maybe you've learned something a little bit about the instrument you play there. So I want you to have a think about what did you what do you now know that you didn't know before the lesson. Um, which ideas do you need explaining in greater depth to help your understanding? So is there something that I explain there that you kind of get a little bit, but you need a little bit more depth with? And also think about what questions you now have as a result of this very short lesson. So has it made you think, oh, hang on, what, what about this though? Why does this happen? Is it the same on a violin? How do harmonics work if you've got a wind instrument? Because I said that it applies to a wind instrument. What's that going to happen? Uh, what's going to happen there? So it's always a good idea after any lesson to think through these things. Think about what you've learned and try and have a proper think about that. Think about what new ideas you've got to, to remove from the, the old ones that maybe you already knew. And make a note of the things that you need explaining in more detail. And then you can go and research them yourself. You can ask a teacher when you come and um, join the course, if you join the course. And if you've got just questions of interest that have arisen, again, make a note of those and bring those along to a lesson in physics if you decide to do physics. Or even if you don't and you've just got questions, if you come to say, Henry Floyd Grammar School to do your A-levels, come and find me and ask me the questions anyway. Um, let's just have a look at the final bit. If there's anything um, that you saw there that you want to do some further research about, that's a, a really good idea. And two things that I think are worth looking at, the little levitation thing that Physics Girl did in her video with those little tiny sort of particles and the LED. Really, really impressive. Um, that was an experiment that was she mentioned uh, which university was doing that in a video. And that's well worth finding more out about. There's some really cool things to do with that that you could look up. And also, noise cancelling headphones. I'm actually wearing some here at the moment to do this um, presentation to listen through to the audio and things. And noise cancelling headphones work on the same principle that produces the nodes that you saw um, on the guitar string on the stationary waves. So it's worth finding out about those because it's a really clever bit of technology. So I hope that was interesting to you. I hope you found out something that you didn't know before. Um, and I hope that you decide to come and do physics um, with us um, at the school. Um, Enjoy the rest of your day with your induction lessons um, and, and maybe see you soon.